We tend to think of supportive care as one clinician or one team delivering care to improve outcomes for one patient. But imagine if you could amplify this effort to improve outcomes for hundreds or thousands of patients. Meet someone who is doing just that. I'm Bogda Koswara and this is Supportive Care Matters. Today's conversation is sponsored by Canteen. My guest today is Shauna Hardy. Shauna is a healthcare leader and a director of a Queensland Youth Cancer Services. Shauna is based in Brisbane, Australia, but I caught up with her while she's in Tampa, Florida, broadening her professional experience as part of the Leslie J. Fleming Churchill Fellowship, examining the models of survivorship care for adolescent and young adults, or AYA, cancer survivors. Welcome to the show, Shauna. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Well, let's start with some basic definitions. What is a youth cancer service and what is AYA? A great question. Let's start with the AYA bit first. So as you've just articulated, AYA stands for Adolescent and Young Adult. And in Australia, that's referring to young people between the age of 15 and 25. And it's important to recognise that the age group in Australia for AYAs is a little bit different than the age group in the United States and in the United Kingdom and other parts of Europe, but 15 to 25 is what we consider. And youth cancer services or YCSs, they're specialist treatment and support for young people with cancer based in hospitals around Australia. So it's a little bit of a joint federal and state government funded initiative. And I understand that youth cancer services are available in each state in Australia and they sort of funded through the joint venture between federal and state. Is that correct? Yeah. So there's five youth cancer service jurisdictions around Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, Vic and Hazza together, South Australia and Northern Territory are together and Western Australia. And the Youth Cancer Services support close to 75% of newly diagnosed AY cancer patients across the country. And they're a little bit different in each of those jurisdictions, but they are an opportunity to, to leverage capability and capacity for clinicians that have expertise in AY cancer. So what really sits underneath all this is a recognition that AYA patients and survivors might have some unique needs or perhaps unmet needs, and that's why there are the unique services of youth cancer services. So perhaps let's start with what are the unique needs of AYA cancer survivors and how do the services meet those needs? Yeah, great question. A diagnosis of cancer for any age is traumatic, but there's some specific needs within that 15 to 25 year old age group. If you cast your mind back to when you were 15 to 25, just a couple of years ago for you, Bogda, it's a time of growing independence. You're, you're moving out of home. You're commencing your studies or career or vocation. You're trying to gain some financial independence. It's also a time when you're developing your identity. So there's some significant psychosocial needs and mental health and development space. And it's also the time when people are starting to forge some of their permanent relationships. Some people are in the relationships where they'll get, they get married and they might have children towards the end of that bracket. And so it's not just the cancer, it's everything else that sits around the cancer, which is significant for a young person, particular diagnosis. So we're trying to support the whole person, not just the cancer and healthcare needs. And of course, the cancers are a unique challenge as well, because the type of cancers that AYA patients might develop are unique. They're probably not that common. Some of them are quite rare. So as I sort of see it, there are very well established services for young patients, pediatric patients with cancer that sit within the pediatric healthcare system. There are common adult cancers that sit within adult system. And for AYA, it's sort of a little bit in between. And there must be the transition thrown in between when the uh, patient with cancer shifts from the pediatric service to an adult service. What is the age of transition in Australia? When you're 15, you probably 
potentially could be referred to the pediatric service, but when you're 25, surely you're no longer there. So somewhere in it, you're going to move. That's a challenge in itself, isn't it? It's a real challenge. And that's why youth cancer services were born, because the federal government recognised that AYA cancer mortality, morbidity and quality of life weren't improving at the same rate as paediatric cancers and older adult cancers. And as you mentioned, AYA cancer, it's not common. But what's different with AYAs and paediatric cancers is that AYA patients are spread throughout various hospitals within a state. But if you're a young or a child or that gets treatment within a paediatric hospital, you're all cohorted into one or two major hospitals within your state. So you get all that expertise within one building while it's spread out for AYA cancers into various hospitals. So it was recognised that there's a need to cohort AYA cancer. doesn't mean putting them all into the one building, but to provide a national network, which is the Youth Cancer Services, to have the ability to talk with clinicians and reference clinical trials and to understand the challenges and opportunities within AYA cancer a little bit better. That transition definitely is a challenge. If you're somewhere in the age of 16 to 17 or 18, that's when you can often make a decision about whether you land in a paediatric hospital or an adult hospital. It's a little bit different around different states. If you're 18 and you get more of a paediatric cancer, then you still might have conversations or your oncologist, more hematologist, might have conversations with a paediatric oncologist or hematologist. So it often depends on what diagnosis you're actually facing. So it's an incredibly tailored approach depending on the type of cancer, the developmental age of the patient, their social circumstances, their sort of life aspirations. And of course, it has to fit the population you're serving. I cannot imagine that a 20-year-old would want to be getting peer support from a 50-year-old or 70-year-old cancer patient. So perhaps through the youth services, you might connect patients with a sort of age-appropriate supports, age-appropriate needs that really, until those services existed, did not exist in a sort of in a systematic fashion. Yeah, they do. And there's not one young person that I've met in my time within the service that hasn't yearned for peer support from someone of a similar age with a similar cancer history. And that can be a real challenge in a state-based service where you might only get that diagnosis once or twice a year. So it's really important to connect at a national level and even occasionally an international level to provide those peer support opportunities for our young people. And the benefit of the youth cancer service system within Australia is that we have some excellent not-for-profits, specifically Canteen is a major not-for-profit targeted at supporting AYAs with cancer when cancer crashes into the world. So it seems to me that well evidenced advocacy is also part of the services because this is how you get the data, this is where you identify gaps, and you can really advocate at sort of national or, as you said, international level. So as an oncologist who treats older adults rather than AYA patients, every so often I would see a young patient, but not very often, I'm kind of in great admiration of what you do because you're really modeling the very holistic approach to patients' care. And also when it comes to survivorship in AYA, you're really planning for long haul because these are the patients who you want to be cured, who are going to be around for decades. And that's how I feel that's how survivorship care should be. So I think we can learn from you. I think there's lots to learn. And when you see a young person with cancer and they lay out their needs and they we recognise that they'll be contributing to the community for 60 to 70 years after their cancer diagnosis, it really reframes what you'd like to do and the support that you'd like to provide and how we would like to empower these young people to manage their supportive care needs for the long haul, not just for this next, you know, five to 10 year period. Exactly. So you mentioned in your 
description of sort of connections between services, you mentioned the international as well as national connections. And obviously, you're now on the road through the Churchill Fellowship. What is the purpose of the fellowship? What are you hoping to learn through the fellowship? And where are you visiting? Yes, I'm currently on the road. We're all at different time stamps as we're recording this, which is a fantastic example of how virtual connections have improved our ability across the board. So I'm on a Churchill Fellowship to investigate AY-specific models of care for cancer survivorship or after cancer treatment support. And we have some wonderful programs within Australia and we certainly aim to support our young people as best we can, but I'm never going to take away opportunities to learn from examples and services and clinics around the world. So I'm currently travelling to understand what partnerships they have within their services and what models of care they have to best support their young people for that long haul, you know, that 60 to 70 years that we just described. And so I'm currently in Florida visiting with the Moffitt Cancer Centre and I've spent some time in Texas with MD Anderson and some time in Los Angeles at the Global AYA Cancer Congress. From then on, I moved to Chicago to visit with the Lurie Cancer Centre and then off to Toronto to visit with sick kids and the Princess Margaret. And then I sojourned further into the United Kingdom, into London, Manchester and Leeds to some of the cancer centres there, off to the Netherlands Cancer Institute and the Italian Cancer Institute to understand what they do and how they do it and hopefully to pick up little nuggets of information along the way that we can implement and apply in our Australian context. It really speaks to the idea that if we want to improve care at the sort of at the high level, we really need to partner broadly. And I think in particular for cancers that are uncommon, like AYA cancers, if you really want to have a critical mass of strategic thinking, you just can't do it within one institution. You really need to collect globally. And I think that that's how advances are made. So I'll be very interested to hear of your learnings once your journey is finished. But for now, let's talk about sort of the big picture thinking and strategy. Your role as a director of the services is actually very strategic and very big picture thinking. So it sort of fits with your fellowship as well. But you are also by training a clinician. How did you transition from the role of a clinician into the leadership role that is really focused on strategy and the big picture? I think that was a little step-by-step process over many, many years. And look, I I definitely pride myself as a clinician. I, I spent many years working in the trenches of healthcare and understand the demands and the joys and successes that you get working within that space. And so I think that clinical background really provides a strong foundation to whatever activities that I do now. But over many years, I took on different project and management roles. Initially, for the first decade and a half of my career, it was a part-time clinician, part-time project manager or people manager. And then it gradually continued to shift to a 75%, 25%, 90%, 10% until over the last number of years, I've spent my time as a full-time healthcare leader or healthcare manager in different spaces. And so there was experience that took me along that path. I also did postgraduate studies as a, in a Master's of Business Administration. I did healthcare certificates at Harvard Business School, which is managing international healthcare programs and different other grad certificates along the way to best support my practice as a healthcare leader with that foundation of a clinician. And it's been really interesting to see and exciting to work with different groups and different organisations to better support a systems-based approach to a sustainable healthcare models. So the listeners to the podcast may not know that your clinical background is in physiotherapy. And it seems to me that that's really very much focused on rehabilitation and normalizing sort of health and so on. So it actually fits very well with the survivorship care that you're currently looking at. But obviously, you must have had a knack for the system thinking somewhere at the very beginning, because it seems like you've had this sort of 
structured and intentional progression into the system thinking. So is there a moment of observation that got you to that point? I think I like how you put structured and intentional because I'm not sure how intentional Maybe it was. It, <laughs> it, it, it seemed almost intuitive at the time, to be honest with you, and that's okay. Uh, look, I always struggle with the idea of not being a clinician, and so I'm glad that that movement was gradual rather than forced because it would have been difficult for me to say, no, I want to move away from that patient care aspect. But I think it came at one point where I had a significant leadership role and I was juggling up the opportunities that were becoming available to me. And my manager at the time said, Shona, even if you didn't take this leadership role, do you think that you would be able to not lead within the space anyway? Do you think you'd still have strong opinions about this systems-based approach? And I recognise that I probably did. It's a bit intuitive for me to think in a systems way. So it was that point that I thought, oh, hang on a second. I think this is my path in healthcare and this is where I can influence in a different kind of way. It might not be that one-on-one patient consultation or interaction, but I can still improve the health and well-being of Australians by taking on these kinds of roles as well. See, this is a strong plug for strong opinions. And I actually think it's not either or. It's, you know, once clinician, always a clinician, and once a leader, always a leader, and they're not mutually exclusive. I actually suspect that you're probably a better leader because you see the clinical purpose of the leadership. And so I think your clinical role informs your leadership, but I think your leadership was probably there when you're doing the clinical work. And maybe it wasn't so direct and sort of well-structured, but potentially accidental, but it seems to me that you got exactly where you were meant to get to. Yeah, happy accidents, Bogdan. <laughs> there are happy accidents, always. So what is this system thinking? Can you explain it to me? What is system thinking? Now you're asking me to talk about leadership and strategy and process Yes, and theory. how you think and how you get ah. things done. <laughs> Systems thinking is an approach to navigating complex environments and it's about considering your environment and taking small bite-sized chunks towards process improvement. So I have a systems-based approach to healthcare where I try and establish models or services around a system rather than a person. So It might be about standardising flows or standardising referrals. It might be about setting up a process to capture all patients with exceptions rather than individually considering every patient referral. So it's an approach rather than an outcome. So can you give me an example? Let's make a sort of hypothetical scenario. Youth Cancer Services in Queensland For those people who are outside of Australia, Queensland is a huge state with lots of different places where patients might be. And you have a big map and a set of darts, and there are various spots where patients in your age group might be located. How would you apply system thinking to improving youth cancer services through Queensland? Can you give me a specific example of what you're doing that would sort of illustrate that? Well, we've just commence seeing patients through our after cancer treatment service. It's called Archways. Archways loosely stands for after cancer health and wellness for adolescents and young adults. And the purpose of the service is to support young people between that transition from acute care in a hospital to community care in that after treatment space. And it's about connecting young people with the right services and supports, and that might be conversations with GPs, community psychology, vocational experts and peer support groups, a whole range of options and opportunities provided through there. And we recognise that in traditional approaches where a clinician within a hospital might write a referral to a separate service, and that happens on this one-on-one level, And it really relies on those hospital clinicians to understand the service and to remember that it exists and to 
get that piece of paper referral through. But in Queensland, we're taking a more systems-based approach to referrals to this after-cancer transition and support service in that we are aiming for 100% of young people to be referred to Archways. It's more of an opt-out situation rather than an opt-in situation. And that means that we capture their referrals at the point of diagnosis and that the referral is automated to that service. And it means that young people will always have access to these transition and support needs rather than it relying on a poor and busy clinician within an acute hospital to remember to make that referral. And then as they get along the track, if they're in that supportive care phase and they think, look, I'm doing really well, I'm happy with where I'm at, I've got the supports that I need, then they discharge or opt out of the service and that spot becomes available for someone that has that acute need. So as you can see, that systems-based approach of it doesn't matter what clinicians are in the room, it doesn't matter who's making the referrals or who's capturing those referrals, that process is all there versus the traditional one-on-one referral framework that we often use within healthcare. So the system approach is systematic, which means that it's not dependent on the goodwill of individuals, of somebody remembering or having a little black book where it's written of who you refer to. And suddenly, if the person with the black book is on annual leave, nothing happens. You sort of do things independently almost of the people involved. It's interesting that this opt-out option is not just that it allows to systematize what you're doing, but it also, I think, provides great um, endorsement of the service because if the service is important and valuable, then it's available to everybody as opposed to a sort of an extra that you only offer when you think about it. Yeah, and it takes that decision-making away for clinicians and for the young people to think, oh, is that necessary? Is that not necessary? I've never met a Y cancer patient that wouldn't benefit from an after cancer support and transition service. Like transition and support required after treatment, it's complex and it's long term. And sometimes the needs change five years after cancer treatment versus 10 years after cancer treatment. And so there, it's about planting or parking those ideas and allowing people to come back to it when and if they need. So if, for example, they're starting a family eight years after finishing their cancer treatment and they're struggling to start a family because of fertility issues that have arisen from cancer treatment, there's a place that they can go and someone that they can talk to about supports that they may require to better allow them to achieve their individual goals. And that might come at a long time, but, you know, the average 18-year-olds not having those conversations when they finish treatment at that particular stage of life. But they they know that that option is available. That's it. And it might just be, hey, this service is available for up to 10 years. Patch in whenever you need it. Mm, Exactly. Now, you've got very lofty ambitions on that because you mentioned 100% adherence. How are you achieving 100% adherence given that in Australia there is a public and private sector and I suspect that your ability to integrate within the two different sectors of healthcare delivery differs? How do you engage with the private sector? It's really unique, these youth cancer service roles, because of that joint federal and state funding if we're specifically considering the federal funding, federal funding is for all people living within that jurisdiction, not just those that land within a public hospital. And so my role as Director of Youth Cancer Service is to connect with all the young people diagnosed with cancer between the age of 15 to 25 in Queensland, regardless of which hospital they land in. And so our team, myself and the Youth Cancer Service Queensland team, connect with the private hospitals within Queensland. It doesn't mean that we're waltzing in and talking to patients at the bedside, but we might communicate with their treating team and provide a second opinion for when discussing chemotherapy protocols 
or we might support them in providing a fertility preservation pathway and saying, hey, this young person, because of the cancer treatment that they're planning to have, it's likely that their fertility will be affected. Here are some options that we use to support fertility preservation in this age group. Or it might be doing a once-off psychosocial assessment to help understand the the unique needs of the AYA at that particular point in time, plus minus some suggestions to consider additional support from community or private psychology providers. So there are many things that a youth cancer service can value add for all patients, whether they're public or private, regional, rural or metropolitan. Sounds to me that you must be quite creative in how you develop solutions to the challenges that you see because you've touched on psychology, fertility, logistics, transport, all the different elements. Surely you didn't pick it up in the sort of physiotherapy training or even (laughs) leadership programs. So how do you cultivate the creativity of leadership? Oh, that's that's a fantastic question. And I think you're right. You have to be a little bit out of the box thinking. And it's certainly not me exclusively. It's the entire team of AYA clinicians, regardless of profession. They're special and they're unique and they're willing to dive a little bit deeper and they're willing to have conversations about things that are completely unrelated to cancer because they know that's what's really going to support this young person. For example, we had a young person that had quite a significant cancer diagnosis in one of our facilities and the team went in to do their all their initial consults and make sure that they're supported. And this young person wasn't so much concerned about their cancer diagnosis. They were concerned that they were going to miss their Year 12 formal and that their Year 12 formal might be somewhere in the middle of treatment and they might not have a full head of hair. And so for them, this aspect was far more significant than the morbidity or mortality risk associated with cancer treatment. And so when the clinician popped out of that treatment and I asked how things went and they stated that they spent most of the time talking about how they could support them and attending the Year 12 formal. And that's the difference between AYA cancer care because you have to talk about and consult with the things that matter to the young person, not the things that matter to you, not even necessarily the things that matter the most to the family around them. But unless you've got the young person on board and you're supporting them in their immediate goals, you're never going to make headways for the long-term care and support that these young people need. And so, yeah, 100%. The clinicians within the hospitals around the country have to be creative. They have to be patient. There might be an extra bit of time attached with consulting with a young person because their needs are a little bit broader than some of the older adult population. But it's really important to consider them as a person, not a UR and not a cancer diagnosis only. It must be incredibly gratifying to be able to do that, to actually recognize that you're making a difference exactly where the patient wants you to make a difference. Yeah, it's gratifying and humbling. And this is one of the reasons why the clinicians love to see the patients in the long term, because they love to hear how things are going and how their goals have been achieved and how they've developed as individuals. Such a unique time frame in a person's life and so much can change within a five-year period and it's absolutely gratifying to see where these young people travel to and, and what they do. There's so much more to them than the cancer. Yeah and, and that's the case with anyone right like that's how we yeah. would really like to think of any cancer patient. Absolutely. It's just a little bit more in your face when we're talking with young people which is a good thing in shaping the services that we provide. Exactly. And I think that that's why we can all learn from the approach that you take in youth cancer services. It's incredibly relevant to other aspects of cancer care or healthcare for that matter. So let's just change direction for a moment and just reflect on your role as a leader. You've described all the different things that you do. You're changing the world. 
one patient at the time. One patient at a time. One okay. patient at the time within the state of Queensland and beyond. You're traveling the world. And of course, that means that you're also away from home and doing a teleconference at 6.30 in the morning on the 4th of July before the fireworks go off. So what are the highlights and what are the lowlights of leadership? <laughs> the highlights are an ability to work with an impassioned team. That's definitely one of the things that I love. And I've worked across different healthcare sectors and oncology specifically, adolescent oncology recruits fantastic and empathetic and dedicated clinicians. And it's an absolute privilege to work with them and to work with the young people themselves in Queensland. We have a Queensland Youth Cancer Service Youth Advisory Group, and these are young people after their cancer treatment. And we meet on a regular basis. And the purpose of the youth advisory groups is to better support and provide advice to and shape the models of care that we use within hospitals. And every time I walk away from those meetings, I'm walking with a lighter step. I feel encouraged by them and by their actions. I'm inspired by their thoughts and their activities and their dedication in this volunteer role. So in terms of leadership, being able to see that broad spectrum, to see the young people, to work with the clinicians, and to see the outputs of collective efforts in supporting adolescent cancers is definitely the things that get me up in the morning and, and help to shape my day. There's barriers to leadership in any space. Being away for eight weeks from my family at current in this Churchill Fellowship it is a challenge and it's a logistical challenge. You should see uh, my eight-week calendars at home with the full gamut of co-curricular activities and school drop-off times and weekend sport activities. Like It's all in there. And so I'm certainly grateful to my family and extended family for their support. And obviously their support's essential at the moment. But in the life of any leader, particularly in healthcare leader, on the background of a COVID pandemic, it's required you to work within a community to help look after the things that are of value to you. And so when you get phone calls early in the morning because there's been a problem at the hospital or a COVID diagnosis, knowing that you can get up and go and that you can leave everything else behind and you've got amazing people to support you in that is one of the challenges, but certainly a blessing at the same time as well. Talking to you, it seems to me that the overarching theme of what drives you is the purpose, the purpose of improving outcomes for patients, making a difference within the health system to people who are affected right there and then. So it's quite appropriate that I'll finish with the question that I try to pose to all the guests at the podcast, and that is, what is your top reason why supportive care matters? Supportive care matters for AYAs because they're different. They're, they're unique and they're separate from pediatric or older adult cancer in the after-treatment space. And if I'm just to finish by sharing these loose statistics that one in three young people after a cancer treatment will struggle with a significant mental health issue, that 60% of young people after cancer treatment will have a high risk of a chronic disease or a chemotherapy or a cancer treatment side effect, that 60% will have ongoing fertility issues and that as a collective they have fewer tertiary qualifications and a lower income than their non-cancer peers for the rest of their lives. We have to consider AYA cancer differently and that's why supportive care matters because it's very obvious and very clear from international research that if you invest, and when I say invest, I'm talking time, resources, people, activity. If you invest in young people now during their acute and just post-acute phase, it will pay dividends and they will contribute to the community for the long run. So I guess my take-home message is that AYA cancer is, is different 
but it's an absolutely rewarding place to be and a rewarding place to work because of the long and many opportunities that these young people have in their lives after cancer. Much that needs to be done and much that can be done. Thank you very much, Shauna. I wish you productive travels for the remainder of your eight weeks and a safe return home. Thank you so much, Bogdan. Lovely to talk with you. All done, folks. That is all for Supportive Care Matters, a podcast created by me, Bogda Koswara, for researchers, clinicians, policymakers, and patients passionate about improving the lives of people affected by cancer. Thanks to Mark Tai, who composed the original music, the Oncology Network, our producers, and Canteen, our sponsors. For show notes, go to www.oncologynews.com.au. Subscribe to this podcast at your favorite podcast provider and rate us. It will help others find us.